Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Based on feedback we received from you, we are doing this webinar on pain management in kidney disease. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your question and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars, within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credit. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credit for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Randy Chen. Dr. Chen has been practicing nephrology in private practice for 13 years in San Mateo County. He sees over 350 dialysis patients along with his partners and has just as many patients with CKD that he regularly sees. He has special interest in improving the lives of patients with kidney disease. Besides treating kidney disease, he is an expert in high blood pressure management and electrolyte and acid base disorders. Dr. Chen has won several awards for his service to the dialysis population. He serves as medical director for SHC Daily City and is medical advisor for Satellite Healthcare Inc. in the Medical Clinical Affairs Division. He says if patients are involved in their own care with guidance by their doctors, they do much better. Outside of work, Dr. Chen has four pug dogs that occupy his time. He is an animal enthusiast, despite being allergic to many of the fur kinds. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, so today's topic, as uh, introduced, is about pain management in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, it's one of the major complaints I have in terms of medical complaints from um, patients uh, in my population, both in my office and at the dialysis centers. It's a very big problem. It affects more than 100 million people in the United States, and the costs related to it are very high at $100 billion uh, per year in the U.S. That means that the amount we spend on pain-related um, treatment and um, diagnosis are more for those than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer all combined. Um, the opioid epidemic, as many of you have probably heard recently in the news um, and as laws have been uh, passed, affects, affects and uh, takes thousands of lives. 130 lives daily, uh, people pass away from opioid-related overdose and um, uh, illness. The causes, uh, this causes an economic burden of over $78 billion a year. So obviously patients have pain, they get treated with certain medications, but oftentimes they can have devastating effects in terms of life, uh, lives taken. So understanding and effectively treating pain is very important, but it can be very difficult. Next slide, please. So what causes pain? Well. If you look at the illustration um, on the right side, uh, you can see, let's say someone has an, uh, a pain in their joint because of arthritis. Um, that triggers uh, nerve fibers to be activated and chemicals at that site that get released um, and by different stimuli such as arthritis or maybe a nail or something. And cables or nerves send those signals from the source here shown as the finger that's inflamed um, or actually hurting to the brain and the brain interprets this as pain. So there are a lot of uh, things that can influence the actual pain signal inside the brain including your thoughts, emotions and, and other factors. Next slide please. So why do we have pain? Well 
it's our bot it's a very useful mechanism for our body to tell us something's wrong and that we should be aware of this so let's say you're somehow you're injuring your body by touching a hot stove your brain's telling you you better remove your hand or you're going to burn and yourself and uh cause injury uh to to your uh tissue if our organs are not doing well then um sensation of pain is very a very important signal of our body is telling us that something is wrong as well for instance chest pain or a heart attack will cause pain in your chest and in those ways um, your body's telling you you need to do something and perhaps seek medical attention next slide please so uh why is pain more common in patients with kidney disease well um pain affects uh the CKD population, uh, that means chronic kidney disease, uh, uh, in over 60% uh, of hemodialysis patients um, experience uh, pain at some point. So that's over half of uh, dialysis patients. Uh, dialysis can cause inflammation just by the fact that your blood is going into a, a, a circuit that's exposed to foreign material like tubes and plastic. and during that process, some of the, um, the chemicals in your body get released because of this process and can cause overall inflammation and pain. There are other reasons, um, including bone disease and other conditions associated with kidney disease itself, which we can talk about uh, in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So what are the causes of pain in patients with kidney disease or common causes? Neuropathy. This is a very common um, pain source. And I'll talk about what neuro how neuropathy is different than like the pain you have when you, you prick your finger or something. Uh, gout is very common because you can't get rid of uric acid and uric acid mediates gout pain. Um, I won't get in too much into that, but a lot of people have gout uh, within their joints. Um, needle insertion to dialysis axis. This is the this is the worst part, right, of uh, patients on dialysis um, in terms of their whole treatment is getting those needles inserted. Um, metabolic bone disease, when your phosphorus is high, when you're, when you're a dialysis patient, and that activates your bones from uh, bone processes in terms of turnover um, and uh, alters that, that can definitely cause bone pain because the bones start to deteriorate. And inflammation, as I mentioned, uh, caused by the process of dialysis itself. Next slide, please. Why does it hurt? Well, uh, it always hurts because it, it, it's useful. And as I uh, said before, it's our bodies telling us something's wrong and that we should pay attention to it. Sometimes our emotions, however, will make this worse. And we, we may interpret pain as more severe than perhaps someone who is not under stress or depressed. But when it starts to affect your daily life and ability to do things, it can be really devastating. Where some people that's all they can do is think of how much pain they're in and concentrate on trying to get rid of that pain um, i'm sure all of us have experienced a time when we've had severe severe pain whether it be just from an injury where it really affected our lives imagine if you had to go through that um, every day of your life for years um, so but we have ways to make pain more bearable next uh slide please so just, I won't get too into the technical aspects or the medical you know, jargon, but um, there are different types of pain. It's a little bit important for the patient to understand the, the differences because they, they have different treatment strategies in terms of addressing those. So there's nociceptive pain. So that's a fancy word for saying that's the pain that mechanical pain. That's the pain when, you know, you, you, you cut yourself on your finger. Um, and it, you know, it's, oftentimes it's described as throbbing, pressure, dull or cramping. Those, that can also be the pain if you had like an infection in your gallbladder or something. So if you see on the, if you uh, refer to the illustration on the right side, nociceptive pain, that's the pain pinprick. There are pain receptors there, and that pain signal gets sent over to um, uh, your brain where it's interpreted as pain. Then there's a neuropathic type of pain. That's the pain where there's actual damage to the nerve and the nerve fibers along the whole, uh, along your body. So that can be the pain where, you know, like let's say you have diabetes and you have injury from the diabetic um, uh, neuropathy that 
the the pain uh, fibers along your uh, you know, you're, you're like near your feet and everywhere, those are actually damaged because of the diabetic injury. That's described as tum, uh, tingling, numbness, burning, or stabbing. Um, you know, when, let's say like when, you're, when your foot falls asleep kind of feeling. So getting a better of idea which type of pain uh, is being um, uh, suffered is, is the way the physician can decide what kind of a diagnosis there might be and come up with an appropriate treatment plan based on that type of pain. Next slide, please. So as I alluded to, there are musculoskeletal, there's musculoskeletal pain, that's usually the pain in joints and bones and back. An example is osteoarthritis. There's inflammatory pain. That's pain caused by um, uh, inflammation. And that, that is where, you know, let's say you have an infection or you have gout where your white blood cells are um, causing all release of all their substances that are supposed to be helpful, but they actually cause pain um, or the perception of pain. Mechanical pain, let's say that's from a compression or a mass. Let's say you have a tumor. Um, you know, in your uh, abdomen or you have a kidney stone, um, that would be the type of mechanical pain where there's like compression. And then neuropathic pain, as we talk, that's sciatica, shingles, diabetic neuropathy, though that's the actual nerve injury al or along the nerve fiber cable, uh, some kind of injury suffered um, more like internally as opposed to the organ uh, uh, and then the pain fibers um, relaying those uh, pain uh, perceptions to your brain. Next sli uh, slide, please. So every organ in your body has pain receptors. Some have more than others, um, but your intestines, heart, lungs, kidneys, they can all sense pain. And that's important. And, and actually your skin, as you may have heard, is an organ. It's the largest organ in, in your body. Uh, and it, ha it has a significant amount of pain receptors because uh, in particular, it's important because it's exposed to the, the external environment. And if, you, if something from your environment is causing you pain, you need to know that. When you feel pain, um, uh, you feel pain when there are mechanical inflama inflammatory or injuries to your organs um, when we're talking about visceral pain. Okay, that's um, what this slide is about. And it's, it's telling you there's something um, wrong in your body internally usually. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a quick slide about, well, you know, um, sometimes like, you know, people describe chest pain as pe uh, pain in their jaw or in their arm. And why isn't it right where my heart is? Well, that's because pain can be referred. And it has something to do with the, the mapping of your pain receptors. Um, so sometimes uh, you say, well, my, um, you know, my kidneys hurt. And, and uh, um, a lot of times people point to their back and I say, well, it could be, but a lot of times that's back pain um, because that kind of pain is different quality. But as you can see, you can see on the illustration that kidney pain can be referred to into the front, into the back, down your legs, in your groin area. So the kidney and urinary tract pain can be referred outside of where your kidneys actually live. And it may seem like it's coming from somewhere else, but if the physician or someone asks you where you, does it hurt, um, or your mom asks you where does it hurt, um, it's, it can be uh, hurting in an area where the organ actually isn't located. Next slide, please. There are acute, there's acute case, uh, pain and a uh, chronic pain. So acute pain is that pain that happens immediately and usually caused by a pro, uh, some that triggers it and tells and then goes away pretty quickly as well. But it tells you to avoid uh, injury, react, and that's the uh, touching a hot stove kind of pain. But then there's the chronic pain, and that's where people really start to suffer a lot over uh, many many uh, you know weeks at uh, at times, um, and it's a constant nerve stimulation or uh, or injury or inflammation of the nerve that um, it, it does not go away. And that's like the diabetic neuropathy or the chronic back pain or the arthritis pain. Next slide, please. So when a care provider asks you questions about what type of pain you're having, they're trying to get to the root of the problem and they're trying to figure out where it's coming from and how they can treat it or diagnose it. So, so um, that's why they ask you the history. They get, you know, they try to find out, well, where is it? What is it like? Is it throbbing? Is it kind of burning? 
Is this a come and go? Um, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Um, then they ex they will examine you. That's part of the physical exam. If you have, um, you know, let's say a gout flare, and they, and you say, my well, my toe hurts. Then they'll look at it and they say, oh, that there's your your big toe is inflamed right where that joint is. Um, or if there's a specific injury to your nerve, or uh, um, they can identify by physical exam, um, by, by looking at, let's say, you have an a injury to one of the nerves in, in your back and your hand can't um, uh, open all the way. That might indicate, oh, well, that's coming from that particular nerve. That can, exam, uh, that can lead to further examinations, including blood tests or x-rays. You know, perhaps you're uh, you complain of abdominal pain and there's concern that it might be your gallbladder. Well, you might get a gallbladder ultrasound and test to look to see if there's any problems with the, uh, with the hepatobiliary system, which is the liver and gallbladder um, system. And then uh, finally, um, once a diagnosis might be established, um, they can figure out what treat, good treatments may be. Perhaps you need medications to decrease inflammation. Perhaps you need local therapy for a sprain or an injury. Uh, perhaps you need injections to try to in decrease the inflammation uh, within the joint or um, area in, in the back or something. Or you, maybe you need medications to dull the pain that you're having uh, from nerve pain or severe pain uh, uh, otherwise. Next slide. So here are the medications that I, as a medical uh, physician, uh, will prescribe or uh, recommend. Um, uh, I'm not talking about anything like injections or anything like that or surgical things, but these are uh, oral medications. Um, number one on my list is acetaminophen. Um, because it's pretty safe, um, you can overdose on that and cause liver failure, but it takes a lot of that, usually more than four or five a uh, thousand milligrams. They usually come in 325 or 500 milligram tablets, so it'd be hard to do that. Um, but you have to be careful. Don't overdo it. Um, some of the opioids also contain acetaminophen in there, so you have to um, uh, be careful, such as Norco and Vicodin. These are the common names that maybe most of you are familiar with. Um, but uh, as we know, opioids come with risks in terms of addiction, uh, potential for death from um, overdose. Anti-inflammatories. Now, these are, these are tricky uh, a lot in chronic kidney disease. I do not uh, prescribe them. I do not recommend them if you have any degree of significant kidney disease, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and steroids, uh, like prednisone, can be anti-inflammatory. Topical agents are generally pretty safe, um, and uh, these can be numbing kind of gels or anti-inflammatory gels. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about these specifics later. Next uh, slide, please. So here's the slide where I'm talking about um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or COX-2 inhibitors. Or, uh, so, um, uh, that stands for cyclooxygenase uh, uh, 2 inhibitors. Um, that's the medical thing. That's where COX-2 came from. But anyway, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs, as they're often abbreviated in medical um, offices, is... Uh, can cause kidney injury if used heavily or long-term, and even if you use just a few, for a few days. If you have kidney disease, they can cause significantly worse than kidney disease without the uh, um, ability to reverse that injury. So I pretty much tell all my patients, because I treat people with kidney disease, unless they don't have kidney disease, I say don't take Advil, don't take Motrin, Aleve, or Celebrex, or Meloxicam, Mobic, um, Voltaren. These are all brands you might be familiar with. The, the, the first words are the, you know, um, the generic, and there are some brand names, but, um, you know, and I, and I don't endorse any particular brand name, but I want you to be aware of these because a lot of times um, people think they're over the counter, I can just get them, how can they cause pain? But if you read the fine print, they might say, oh, don't be careful, talk to your doctor. But um, when you have kidney disease, I, I, I pretty much tell everyone not to take them, okay? Um, sometimes the kidney injury is permanent, sometimes it's temporary, but the risk is pretty high. So I say, why, why risk it? Um, and I've seen very significant injury where, to the point where they did end up on dialysis because they took so many of these things. Next line, please. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so there are medications for nerve pain, and the, uh, gabapentin is a very um, uh, common one that many of you may be familiar with. That's usually the one that you'll see when you have diabetic uh, nerve pain, but it's used in many in many things, such as shingles and other nerve uh, ne uh, neuropathic pain. There's a tricyclic antidepressants. You think, well, why should I need an antidepressant? It actually somehow uh, decreases the pain perception. So there's only one that I usually use um, commonly. It's called um, amitriptyline. And then there's, you may have seen commercials where they say, oh, depression hurts and, you know, you need this kind of medication. Now, well, that's the one that's duloxetine. And that one also has some ability to decrease perception of pain and is often used by pain specialists and uh, people who uh, not only have significant pain from um, um, uh, just overall, but um, from um, depression related as well. Next section, please. Next slide, sorry. Um, why should you manage your pain? Well, because pain can affect your quality of life. And life. It can affect your ability to do things that you enjoy. Um, when you're in pain, you can have, often have depression and anxiety and poor sleep. Those will all affect your ability to function well. People with um, uh, pain um, have uh, uh, actually decreased survival. So if you improve your pain, you'll live longer. Next slide, please. So I talked about gabapentin earlier. I mentioned it. It's very commonly prescribed for nerve pain. It works in the brain and it interferes with signals that the uh, brain interprets as pain. But it's it's not quite clear how um, it it actually uh, is uh, it works. But I mean, it originally was used as a, an anti seizure medication. So it really works in the brain, but because it works in the brain, it can have some side effects, such as making you sleepy, having, um, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, central nervous system side effects. Um, but it has been very, shown very effective in diabetes and shingles pain, um, and, it, uh, and it doesn't numb your nerves in the sense that, like, the nerve itself, but it somehow inter, uh, it interacts with your brain chemistry and makes your brain interpret pain as less. Next slide, please. Um, I get a lot of questions about CBD oil. In my state of California, uh, marijuana has been legalized. Uh, it used to be you could get it for medicinal purposes only. Um, now it's available um, to the general public. Um, so cannabis uh, products have been um, uh, gaining some popularity because they do seem to help pain. Now, CBD oil or cannabidiol oil is the one I get asked about most and it's the one that a lot of patients come up to me and say I've been using this oil they usually ingest it and say um, it's really helped me now the CBD oil does not cause the euphoria or high effect of marijuana THC um, and uh, it's available over the counter uh, but um, good research and studies have not been performed on CBD oil and there's no quality control. So, um, you know, buyer beware. You have to use these products at your own risk. They are available. I've not seen a lot of negative uh, or um, bad side effects from CBD oil in terms of anything like over, overdose or um, things like that. Marijuana, of course, can cause you to be, uh, become high and alter your perception of reality. So I, I do recommend uh, caution with these kind of products, but I do have patients telling me that it does prove effective in somehow making their pain or sense of sense of pain improved. Next slide, please. Narcotics and opioids. Well, um, these can be very effective for pain control and acute and chronic pain, but the addiction and abuse potential is huge. We've probably all had some experience in terms of like, you know, maybe dental work or some kind of surgery where we got, you know, prescribed some Vicodin and we got like 10 pills and say, okay, use these if you really need them. Um, and then that's it. Um, those usually don't, aren't the biggest issues. The biggest issues are um, when you start to become addicted and use the long acting or, or the uh, more potent types that have the, the uh, more um, kind of high side effects like fentanyl and Demerol. 
Um, these can accumulate and um, cause low blood pressure, constipation, um, people stop breathing. That's usually how people overdose. It, de if it decreases your respiratory drive. Um, and these, all these significant side effects will happen in most patients who take them. Um, and if you take enough of them, they can cause death. Um, and the reason why addiction is so um, uh, um, prevalent is because these make people feel high and it makes people, people feel euphoria. And this can be magnified in patients with kidney disease. In general, it's based, if you need to take these medications, um, it's generally uh, good to start at a low dose and gradually increase, and then also stop it when it's no longer needed as soon as you can. Some indications can be dialyzed and some cannot, and so those need to be discussed with your kidney doctor. Next slide, please. Um, shorter acting medications like fentanyl may be a better idea than longer acting medications in kidney disease patients since they have eliminating a problem eliminating long acting medications from the body. That being said, however, the shorter acting can cause more high. Um, uh, the high feeling, and you may have heard in the press, fentanyl and these kind of medications, sometimes they're added into these illegal, uh, illegally obtained opioids and um, are more likely to cause death. So if they are prescribed or given um, by a, a medical professional, perhaps during surgery, um, they need to be careful about the dosing and um, frequency of those medications. Tramadol is a very weak um, uh, opioid in terms of the, of the high effect, but it's also not very good at pain control either. So it is commonly prescribed, but I get the feedback that it's generally not doesn't cut the pain out as well as perhaps another medication in the opioid or narcotic family. Next section, next uh, slide, please. So the topical analgesics, usually there's no problem at all with these. I, you know, you can't really overdo it too much um, unless, you know, maybe your neighbor doesn't like the smell of them. But um, they do ha cause cooling and heating feelings that help to decrease the sensation of pain. Um, some of the popular brands you may be uh, familiar with are Bengay, Icy Hot. Um, so capsaicin cream um, is the kind I often may recommend um, to uh, patients who um, have arthritic pain because it decreases a sub, uh, something called substance P, which is right near the nerve, and that that actually um, substance P influences nerve signals. So that's pretty good for arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis pain. Other um, pains are anesthetic, such as the lidocaine. There are new ones that are available over the counter before they used to only be prescribed lid lidoderm patches, but there's Salon Pass, that's a popular one, it has lidocaine in it. And that actually numbs the nerve itself and decreases the signal transduction of pain along the nerve fiber. Um, anti-inflammatory, uh, topical anti-inflammatories, those I, I don't have a big problem with. Um, diflofenac gel, uh, uh, sorry, diclofenac gel um, is a, uh, uh, comes in creams or gels and oftentimes can locally deliver anti-inflammatory medications. Oftentimes they, however, are not enough to penetrate deeply enough to treat something like gout or hip pain. Next section, next uh, slide. There's the old fashioned uh, rice, which is rest, ice, compression, elevation. That's the kind that you see all the athletes getting uh, for musculoskeletal injury. Hot and cold um, can be alternated. When inflammation is the uh, key process, cold is better. What it does is it decreases circulation to that. And so the, the, there's less blood flow to that area and all the white blood cells who are coming to that area to, to, to come to the rescue, but actually cause worsening pain. Um, those guys don't get into that area as much. When you want to relax muscles, um, uh, like let's say you have stiff muscle or you know muscle cramping, heat will may actually be better because it increases circulation and brings blood flow to muscles that need extra blood flow to bring to uh, to bring um, chemicals away from where the muscles are starting to accumulate. Um, um, the pain, pain causing uh, chemicals in the body. And compression uh, decreases swelling and swelling 
uh, also decreases, uh, sorry, I'm swelling increases pain. Next slide, please. So other considerations for pain treat, pain, uh, pain in, in patients with kidney disease, medication adjustments are often needed because medications may not be uh, eliminated from the body as quickly because many times the kidneys get rid of these. Um, so they may last longer and, or you may need a less potent dose. It's also, my, my uh, tenet is to uh, start low and go slow and, um, and, and uh, don't go um, you know, too quickly in terms of adjusting up either. Um, NSAIDs are generally not favored as we talked about. Um, medications may have a ceiling effect. I may not relieve the pain well enough, but I don't recommend going over the, the recommended dose, particularly with something like Tylenol or acetaminophen because um, that can cause a, a fatal liver, uh, liver injury. Um, many medications are not dialyzed or moved from the body and may, off, may wear off during uh, dialysis. So let's say you take a pain medication before dialysis and it usually lasts you four hours, but now uh, halfway through your dialysis, you're starting to feel the pain again. It's probably because that medication is being dialyzed out. Next slide. So this is the, one of the biggest complaints uh, in terms of pain within the dialysis center itself during the dialysis treatment is cannulation of needle access. So those patients who are listening who are on dialysis, um, they, can, they can testify to this. Um, these needles aren't these small needles we use for blood draws. These are huge needles, 15 gauge needles. They're um, they're size of a shish kebab skewer. So they um, um, they can really be painful when you're going into the skin. Um, I I often um, offer my patients. Um, topical analgesics and it seems to help just like when you go to the dentist and they put that little maybe cotton swab in your mouth and it's coated with something that's the topical analgesics that that um, is what will numb your skin prior to them actually putting the needle in there and doing the lidocaine injection so they have lidocaine cream and emla cream but recall that it takes it takes several minutes for this stuff to wear uh, to start to be effective so I say 30 minutes prior um, there, were, um, there was some concern that maybe it changes your texture of your skin and things like that, but I have not found that to be, um, looking at the medical literature, I have not found that to be a, a huge problem. Uh, local injection of lidocaine or similar local an anesthetics um, by your um, dialysis technician or nurse in the area of where the numb, uh, needle is uh, uh, inserted can be very helpful and I, um, oftentimes patients do require this. Some patients just say, you know, I, I can take it and just be quick and, and, and accurate. Over the time, uh, over time, the, that area of the skin can get less numbness um, and less sensitive to pain. So um, uh, that might also uh, be a relief to some people to know if, if Right now, they're just starting to use their fistulas. Um, down the line, it's not as painful. Next line, please. Um, so also, you know, patients who are in dialysis, they have to sit in these chairs often for like, um, you know, uh, hour, hours at a time. Um, so neck and back pain is often common. Lumbar and cervical support may reduce the strain. I often tell, you know, the, uh, the pillows you can get, you see, or you can get um, when you take a long airplane ride, those neck pillows can be very um, helpful in uh, supporting your neck. If you look at these, like um, the slide on the right, you can see these guys have different postural problems, but look how the spine, it curves, right? It's not a straight line. So, and your head and your skull is heavy. It's got a big brain in there. Um, so that that neck pain is often pretty severe. And if you're not supporting it and you're sitting there and in a in a seat which has no curve, you're obviously going to get some pain. So I often tell people bring a pillow, bring a little towel rolled up in a little roll, and put it behind your neck to support. Lumbar and support pillows. You can see there's a curve in the back there. Um, you know, and, and, and our chairs are made ergonomically. So, uh, and, and you know, I, I don't know how many bed 
bed commercials there are on on TV and radio, but they're saying, well, you know, you got to get a good night's sleep. You have to support your spine. So all these are actually important. Stretching can help. A lot of people get stiffer when they have to sit in these chairs all the time. So perhaps doing some stretching, some uh, moderate exercise or low level exercises. Um, and using ergonomic chairs, uh, chairs, desks, um, you know, there's a lot of people who have standing desks, so then they have to sit all the time. And just maintaining good posture. You can see here, you probably um, don't look like the ideal posture person. Um, and um, it's better to try to keep your spine in the alignment that it, it was meant to be in. Next slide. Um, briefly, procedures and surgeries, usually these are um, when, when other, um, you know, conventional therapies uh, are not effective, but there are specialists out there uh, that can do injections, epidural injections, steroid injections, botulinum toxin, surgical decompression to decompress nerves that are being constantly um, aggravated or moving and often uh, and obviously, if you have acute pain, uh, removing a, a ner uh, an organ that's like a gallbladder or something, or a tumor that's causing mechanical um, pain. Next slide, please. Um, there are pain specialists out there. They don't all just do injections. They can do medical management. Um, if traditional treatments through your primary care, your nephrologist and other um, physicians or um, specialists like chiropractors, um, are not effective, um, uh, sometimes you need an expert. Um, and there are other therapies that many patients find very effective like acupuncture, electrotherapy, um, massage therapy. Um, so I, I, I encourage patients to look at other things that um, might, might benefit them that might be complementary as well. Next slide, please. There are a lot of challenges in pain management. It's a complex interplay of nerves, chemicals, and the brain. Hopefully, I reflected some of that on my talk. There are many types of pain, as you probably now realize or have realized, and where they're coming from and how we can treat those specific pain sources are, can be very tricky. Um, and pain control can take a lot of um, different therapies. Maybe one therapy not, might work. Maybe one approach may not work for you, but someone else. But don't give up. I know that pain can affect um, people's lives. And really, as, I, as we, we said, it, it's like more expensive than diabetes and cancer uh, and, and heart disease combined in terms of the cost that um, medical, uh, the medical uh, community and patients spend. So obviously um, it is a huge problem. Um, and there has been a lot of controversy, as you know, recently about how to manage it and medications. But um, working with your physicians, complementary medication uh, specialists um, uh, is uh, does often um, help to alleviate pain in, in terms of finding the right approach for every patient. Next slide, please. Well, thank you for listening. Um, I'll, I will take questions from the moderator. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, we really appreciate you for leading such an excellent webinar. So at this time, I'm gonna read a few of the questions that we've received from our audience. Um, so the first question is, my husband can't walk and is very weak. I've heard that this happens when patients are on dialysis and it's due to atrophy. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with this? Uh, that's, that's a great question and that is a very, um, a very uh, important topic. In fact, you know, as a, I'm, a, I'm an advisor with, um, with Satellite Healthcare and we are doing research in that very uh, field because we know patients get weaker, they get debilitated, their muscles atrophy, and if you can't walk, I mean, what kind of life is that? So we're actually looking at exercise in dialysis patients. I mean, you're sitting there, but why can't you do a little bit of activity? We also are looking at, um, you know, getting people into strength, um, uh, strength training programs. It really, um, just doing what, you know, people do when they get weak. Um, 
it's like you're in bed for four hours extra a day. So if you've ever gotten sick and been in bed, you feel weak, tired, you can hardly walk sometimes. That's how some people on dialysis feel all the time. So doing, you know, stretching exercises to increase muscle strength, that is key. Um, and it's hard because most people, like after dialysis, they feel tired. They don't want to do anything, but any little thing. I mean, instead of just sitting in a chair, standing up for, you know, a, a few minutes uh, uh, more a day, walking, things that are easy, and also a little bit of resistance training, you know, little dumbbells, um, things like that. Um, um, and, you know, it's hard to say that this is easy in a patient who's, who's 85 years old and already has arthritis and things. But if you want to know what can be done about that, it is, it is more, um, you know, low-level exercise activity that, that as can be tolerated if you can, if you can do it. And that's, that's, you know, being cautious if you have things like congestive heart failure, cardiac disease, you know, bad, bad joints and things. But I do think a little bit of resistance, um, maybe some physical therapy that's prescribed is, is a way to in improve weakness and loss of strength and improve the muscle atrophy and uh, that occurs when people are on dialysis. Right. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Um, somebody said, I get massive leg and feet cramps, and they're especially bad in the middle of the night. What can I do? Okay, well, cramp, these are all like so very commonly asked questions when I see my dialysis patients, and sometimes they don't get a great answer, and, and it's unfortunate because sometimes we don't have a good answer. Cramping is one of those things, but in my experience, it's, you know, when you're an athlete, you cramp because you don't have elect electrolytes and, and, and your muscles are working and they need, they need things like that. But in like a dialysis patient or a, a patient who's on a, di a water diuretic, maybe for, for their heart and, and on other medications, um, oftentimes it's a problem with the water amount in your muscles, okay, um, what, and, and tissue. And what happens is when you go to sleep, right, your legs are up. The fluid is, has been settling in your legs and muscles in the legs. Um, and, you know, that's why you have swollen feet and your, your shoes don't fit at the end of the day. Um, and when you raise them in the bed, all that fluid starts to get pumped back into the other parts of the body because gravity is not there forcing all the fluid down. And a lot of times when you have health issues, you're, 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 the veins in your legs have um, little valves so that prevents blood from a backflow, okay? That's just a mechanical thing. But when you're standing and you're you maybe older or have some extra weight on, those valves don't work. They become insufficient. And so, um, um, but when, you, when you're sleeping, all that fluid leaves those muscles and then they cramp up. Or if you're on dialysis and they take too much fluid, you cramp up. And that's because the muscles are basically getting dehydrated. They're, they're losing their water. So, you know, that's that's a difficult thing. We used to give things like quinine and vitamin E, and that seems to help some cramping. There's not, not hugely great answers in terms of decreasing cramping, but if you're talking about dialysis, be careful with the amount of uh, fluid you drink because if they're take, trying to take off too much fluid because they have to because you're short of breath or that's where you have to be in terms of your, your water content in your body, if you're drinking fluid, the, more, the faster that fluid gets taken out of your body, the more likely you are to cramp. And also for those who have cramps at night, who are on diuretics, sometimes using support hose or things that don't let the water go settle into your muscles and your feet can help prevent the cramping at night. Um, sometimes, cal yeah. sometimes calcium, you know, um, supplements help some people and usually can't overdose on calcium or anything. So um, that seems to be also a little bit helpful. All right. Well, thank you for that great answer. So we have a couple questions about gout. Um, someone said, I have gout and the pain in my feet is terrible. Um, what can I do to manage it? And then someone else also asked about managing gout with cherry juice. Could you talk a little bit about gout pain management? Sure, sure. Um, well, um, so gout, I knew I'd have a question about gout because it's so, it's so common and particularly in patients with kidney disease. A lot of things cause gout. That's a, that's a 60 plus minute talk in itself. But um, 
people with uh, kidney disease have more gout because they have more uric acid. Um, and, and that's because a lot of times they don't get rid of it or the diuretics interfere with that. Um, so where does gout come from? Gout comes from uric acid. Uric acid comes from mostly food um, that you eat, which includes animal protein, alcohol, um, seafood. So watching your diet can decrease uric acid production. Um, gout happens when crystals start to form within the joint, and then all those crystals make the white blood cells come into the joint and then you get terrible pain. So decreasing uric acid with medications like allopurinol um, is the common one, can help, dietary, and, um, and you know, you're like, well, I can't use the NSAIDs, right? Then that's a traditional treatment for gout. But there are things such as colchicine, which basically freezes the white blood cells. It basically paralyzes them. And those guys can't get in the joint and they can't wreak the habit. And cause all the inflammation. Um, prednisone is a not is is a steroid uh, anti-inflammatory. I don't like to use it for long periods, but it's quite effective in knocking out gout pain if you use in short courses, local injections. Um, but what I say is, if you can take a medication or watch your diet and decrease your uric acid, we like to get that below six or seven. Um, then you're going to have less uh, gout attacks. So from a patient perspective, you can watch your diet. Look online for a low purine, that's P-U-R-I-N-E, diet. And, um, and also uh, talk to your healthcare professional about medications to lower uric acid. Cherry really? juice. So, oh, sorry. Cherry yeah. juice. Sour cherry juice. I don't know much about. I know there are some anecdotal kind of um, thoughts that it can decrease that, but there are more, much more potent medications that are prescribed that are generally safe um, that, um, you know, really will decrease the uric acid much more than cherry juice would. Well, that's well said. Thank you. Um, so someone else had a question. What are non-medication techniques that are useful to assist with pain management and kidney disease? Well, um, as I said, you know, some exercise stretching, because a lot of the pain in kidney disease is, um, is uh, mechanical in nature, and it's from stress on joints like the spine, um, and also building up muscle, because muscle actually supports the bones. And that's why, you know, if you ever do exercise, they always talk about the core strength, core this, core that. Um, and, and that's because the core is your spine and in your central body. I mean, you're, you, who needs uh, strength in their little toe? Nobody. But, um, you know, you do need a lot of core strength in order to support this big, you know, th this big body. So um, heat, ice, uh, the things I mentioned, um, um, those are non-medical. Acupuncture can be very effective in certain specific pain syndromes and like back pain. Um, massage therapy, some people swear by chiropractic adjustments. Um, you know, hip, hypnotherapy, electrotherapy. There's so many non-medical complementary treatments out there. Myself coming from a medical background and understanding the ways medicines work, I usually give that advice, but I am totally um, supportive of complementary therapies if they work and that, and, and they're given by someone experienced and, and they're not just trying to sell you some new, you know, snake oil or miracle cure. You know, but I do think some kind of physical manipulation and strengthening is generally what I, uh, for, for musculoskeletal type pain, for neuropathic type pain, you know, acupuncture, hypnotherapy, things like that can be very helpful. Well, thanks for those tips. Um, so someone else asked, I get stomach pains a few days prior to every dialysis session. Should I still go to dialysis? <laughs> yes, yes, you should. You should go dialysis. I mean, I have patients they get they get stomach pain, but they also get you know diarrhea and and. But obviously, you know, the dialysis is necessary. You should talk to your nephrologist about this. Perhaps it's some, it has something to do with your medications. Um, maybe something's been given at dialysis. You know, their medications given on dialysis and they're causing you some problems. Um, you need to discuss that with your nephrologist and find out, is there some reason why right every day after I go to dialysis, I feel this pain? 
and uh, get to the root cause of that. And that's part of why this talk was given was just to kind of say, um, you know, let's find out where it's coming from and let's deal with it, let's get rid of it and or let's treat it. So, but uh, obviously your, if you, your body needs dialysis, I know there's some inflammatory things there, but without enough dialysis, you, your life will be shorter. Um, we know that from research. Thank you for that. Um, so someone else asked, uh, do pain medications adversely affect blood pressure? Yes, um, the narcotics, as I mentioned in the talk, do lower blood pressure. Um, a lot of times, you know, when, when in the hospital, I'll, I'll be I'll I'll, in, I'll be called because someone's blood pressure is low, and I'll, the first questions I'll ask is, did they get um, you know some pain meds? Did they get an anti-anxiety medication? Um, is, yeah, they just got some morphine. I'm like, well, that's the reason. And so, um, in terms of raising blood pressure, generally um, not not directly. But uh, the NSAIDs are not the, the like the ibuprofens that can cause fluid retention and raise your blood pressure. And again, if you have chronic kidney disease, and even if you're on dialysis and you still make a little bit of urine or you haven't been on that long, I say avoid NSAIDs. All righty. Um, we have another question. Uh, my legs are in pain and my hands and my back sometimes as well. Could this be related to kidney disease or dialysis? Um, those are so. If this is coming from a patient who is on dialysis, uh, yes, it can be. There are um, there's something called hyperparathyroidism or metabolic bone disease in kidney disease. And that's why the dietitians at the dialysis unit are always tell you not to eat phosphorus, to take your binders. You know, this medication will help you with that. Because if you look at the bones of patients who've been on dialysis and who have not had their phosphorus well controlled for a long time, there are cysts in those bones. Those bones look really bad. They have um, deterioration of the calcium at the ends of the bones. And the ends of the bones are where all the stress comes, you know, because that's where bone meets bone. Um, I mean, there's cartilage in between there. But um, that's where all this pressure goes. And if you aren't watching the phosphorus because you're on dialysis and your your, your parathyroid level is too high, you will get pain um, in, in the hands and, and, and joint area. And so that's why we, we put so much emphasis on that because we know it causes pain, we know it can cause uh, fractures and, and, and tendon ruptures, ligament ruptures. Um, and those can those can be really devastating to health. Um, also, you know, generalized inflammation with dialysis occurs, and a lot of times the patients on dialysis have a lot of other, other medical problems that are going to contribute to pain. Um, and as you get older, your cartilage in the joints wears down, and so um, you'll get osteoarthritis, and so that can definitely cause pain in your hands and joints. Um, and so that's for dialysis patients. In patients with chronic kidney disease, you know, if it's early chronic kidney disease, it's probably the usual stuff like arthritis. It's usually not because anything related to the kidney is not functioning well. Um, although patients who do have, you know, earlier stages of chronic kidney disease can have parathyroid issues, and and I and I treat and look at that with every with every patient who has some uh, renal insufficiency. All right, thank you for that response. We have another question that says, um, some dialysis texts stick me and there's no pain. Others stick me and it's unbearable. What is the difference in technique that allows for painless sticking and how can I you know, have more painless um, sticking during dialysis? Sure, well, you know, everyone everyone thinks uh, it's just this guy. His, his, somehow his needle is different from that guy's needle, but, um, uh, or his technique actually. And usually it's not a technique issue, it's usually because they, they get right on a nerve, like a nerve ending, and somehow that that portion of the skin is more sensitive. You know, I think most technicians are, are pretty good, but, and some, some just have that calming kind of, you know, confidence, they get it right the first stick, they don't have to stick many times. Um, but um, I think it's probably just, you know, 
uh, they're getting the nerve or maybe they're sticking in, in a wrong place. If it's the same technician, it could be their technique. And sometimes it has to do with the angle of approach of their needle. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, I'm not a technician, but you know, I, I know this complaint comes from a lot of a lot of people, and it might be because they are a little little rougher. They just they don't warn you, they don't, you know, they don't prepare you. They just go, and you're like ah, and 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 it hurts more because of your you're either overly nervous or too uh, or not prepared at all. So um, you know, I think that has something to do with the technician when it's always the same technician. Now. Um, that as I said, the the numbing cream like Lido uh, lidocaine gel or lidocaine cream, Emla cream, which is another numbing cream, 30 minutes prior to cannulation, and also, let's say that tech, technician um, is going to do you, and you know it always hurts when they stick you. Just tell them I need the lidocaine, okay? And they'll put a little little thing under the skin, and you know within a couple minutes that that skin will be numb, and hopefully that cannulation will not hurt as much. Thank you, that's a great tip. All right, so this is our last question. I was told once you're on dialysis, you should not take blood pressure medication. Is this true? Um, not really the pain so much, but um, it is not true. Um, uh, definitely not true. Um, but there are, we've, we're doing research studies uh, in terms of whether you should hold the, your blood pressure medicine before dialysis or continue taking it. If you always drop your blood pressure during dialysis, that might not even be a blood um, a effective blood pressure medication. That might be just because we're there taking fluid off in a way that your body doesn't like. It might be your heart's not strong, very strong. Um, generally, uh, I, uh, my approach is take your blood pressure medicine as you normally would because most patients are on high blood pressure medicines, we can adjust them, but don't just hold them on your own or don't just stop taking them. Sometimes blood pressure medicines are um, uh, not prescribed because you need it for blood pressure. They're also prescribed for other reasons to protect your heart. So let's say you're on something like metoprolol, but your blood pressure is pretty good, but you've had a heart attack. That metoprolol is going to uh, pre uh, may prevent you from having another heart attack or an arrhythmia because it helps protect the heart in other ways by pre preventing too much exposure to adrenaline and too high a heart rate. So um, please always talk to your physician and nurses about blood pressure medicines and don't just say, I was, I thought I was supposed to stop my blood pressure medicines. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Chen. This concludes today's webinar. Um, we will have two webinars next month. Our first webinar will be Clinical Trials and Kidney Disease in Spanish, held on October 8th and hosted by Karini Nunez. Our second webinar will be Kidney Chat, Ask a Social Worker, held on October 23rd and hosted by Kathy Merritt. Registration is open for both. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again.